Can we ask about the trade agreement with uh, Europe and Europe's request about um, free trade agreement with them before uh, as a priority? And uh, how, how did you respond to that? Sure. Uh, so I'm not sure that, that well, not, the European didn't, Union didn't ask for that. So they may have been written up that way. Um, the fact is that our discussions around a free trade agreement with the European Union are more advanced. Uh, the fact is that the UK is not in a position to commence any negotiations on a free trade agreement until such time as they formally exit the European Union. At a minimum, that's presumably two and a half years away. Uh, it could be as long as three years away. So in the interim, uh, we already have mature conversations in place with the European Union. We've got a scoping study that should be concluded by the end of this year, a scoping study that will look at uh, what the potential benefits are that will flow from an EU Australia FTA. Uh, I would hope then once they move through some of their internal European processes and I myself would need to go to Cabinet to receive a mandate on negotiations, that we might commence EU Australia FTA negotiations in the first half of next year. That more than likely is going to be closer to the middle of next year than to the start of next year. Um, but it's really comparing apples with oranges because the UK remains a part of the EU uh, until such time as the formal Brexit takes place. Uh, and then at that point in time is when the UK is in a position to commence formal negotiations around an FTA. But Brexit, did it in some way affect uh, the ongoing European free trade agreement? No, our discussions with the EU continue apace um, and, uh, and our scoping study continues. Uh, officials are meeting. Uh, I just was last week met with Cecilia Malmström, my EU uh, Trade Commissioner counterpart, uh, a really warm and cordial meeting where we agreed that uh, we would continue to progress this uh, with the expectation of hopefully f uh, formal commencement, as I said, uh, the first half of next year, but closer to the middle of next year. Uh, this question is about the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership Agreement. Will Australia ratify the DPP? If yes, when? And how is it going to impact the other free trade agreements that you have and opportunities for economic engagement in the ASEAN region? So Australia... Uh, the Australian government's position is that we would like to see ratification of the Trans-Pacific Partnership within, the Australia, within Australia. Uh, ultimately, it's a decision of the Parliament, uh, but clearly the government is supportive of the agreement that we've entered into on the TPP. Uh, the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties commenced hearings into this process, uh, and they did that uh, prior to Parliament proroguing for the election. Uh, now that Parliament's uh, recommenced, uh, the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties will once again turn their attention to the TPP. They'll have to work out as a parliamentary committee the timetable they're working to and when they will report back. Uh, there are some statutory requirements around that that the committee's got to comply with, but ultimately that's not at my direction as Minister, that's for their determination as a parliamentary committee. Um, but the government's position is that we certainly are supportive uh, of TPP. Um, in terms of impact that will have on uh, our interaction with ASEAN and others. Obviously we already have a, a FTA, a free trade agreement with ASEAN, the Australia-New Zealand ASEAN free trade agreement. Uh, that's an agreement that we're looking at comprehensively updating uh, through the RCEP process, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. I was in Laos uh, several weeks ago as part of the ministerial RCEP meeting. That conversation and negotiations continues. Um, I'm excited because there's a very high level of, high level of ambition with respect to RCEP. Uh, all participant countries are bringing to the table uh, you know, a really high level of ambition, which uh, Australia certainly encourages and is supportive of. So hopefully RCEP might be in a position, <coughs> say, around the middle of next year to reach a conclusion, but we'll just have to see how negotiations continue. So the fact is that Australia is well placed with respect to RCEP, uh, well placed with respect to TPP, uh, we have trade as being a key driver of our economic growth. Our ability to open up with the world, engage with the world is underscored, uh, in many respects has underpinned uh, our 25 years of continuous economic growth and uh, I'm confident that we'll be able to continue uh, into the future through additional market preferential access into different markets. Minister, can I just ask you, trade's also a bit of a key driver of political opposition in the new Senate that you're facing now. You've got a crossbench of of quite a few that are opposed or at least philosophically sort of question the benefits. Sure. Um, I, I'm just wondering whether you think that your sort of 
I mean, Australia's often been said to be free trade Taliban, um, but uh, does that mean you're out of the club sort of going forward? You know, how do you see the, your opposition and the, and the challenge of trying to convince Senator Xenophon and you know, various, various senators to support you here? Well, my starting point is to be respectful of the viewpoint that they hold. Um, I'm respectful of the fact that uh, some Australians feel alienated uh, by globalisation and the consequent impact that we've seen through globalisation. Um, often people will blend globalisation and advances in technology with free trade. Uh, those are related but separate issues. Uh, but I intend to engage in good faith with the Senate crossbench. Um, I'm mindful of the fact that they have a constituency, but I'm not going to take a backward step in being a strong advocate around the benefits of free and liberalised trade. Uh, the fact is that what is for many policy orthodoxy of the of this century, which has helped to deliver, uh, helped to deliver increased and improved living standards, uh, helped to deliver uh, economic strength, helped to drive, as I said, Australia's 25 years of continuous economic growth, the uh, envy of the developed world. Um, these are consequences of our ability to open up to the world. Um, we can compete with the best of them, uh, and I intend to make sure that Australians understand that the only thing that protectionism will assure them of uh, is lower levels of prosperity and lower living standards in the future. Um, it's a bit of a siren song, protectionism. Uh, we need to make sure that we rebut uh, the false claims of the pro-protectionists with the cool, calm, factual analysis that free trade actually has improved Australia's position in the world. You can talk about the giving update on the free trade agreement with India. Uh, the FTA with India, obviously, at the outset, uh, we had a high level of ambition. Uh, Prime Ministers Abbott and Modi uh, had the desire to conclude an FTA <coughs> with India uh, within 12 months. Uh, understandably, that was a very ambitious timetable. Uh, there are challenges uh, on both sides, and we're respectful of that. Uh, my predecessor, Andrew Robb, certainly gave it his best endeavours, as did uh, the Indian side, but we weren't able to resolve all the outstanding matters. I last met with my Indian trade counterpart in Vientiane uh, in Laos and we agreed to undertake a stock take. Uh, in other words, to basically look at where both sides were with respect to our FTA uh, and look at what our offers were across um, goods, services, so on and so forth. Um, that process is now currently underway. That will conclude in the months ahead. Uh, at the conclusion of that stock take, there will be the opportunity to re-engage uh, with a view to trying to resolve the outstanding issues. You know, I, I'd like, I have to regionalize a little bit. Uh, what, what are the biggest challenges for the trade with South America and especially with Brazil? It's a strong economy, 200 million people. I know Wall Street is doing that good job there, but what are the biggest challenges besides logistics? And I know we have a focus on Asia for obvious reasons, but what are the biggest challenges and what you would do, what are you doing to change that? I think there's some real opportunity with respect to uh, Latin America. I was there several weeks ago and had the chance to uh, visit Colombia and Chile. Uh, I think there's a lot of potential with respect to Latin America, and so it's an area that I intend to explore more in the future. Some of the to use your phrasing, challenges are probably that there's a lack of engagement uh, historically, and we want to make sure that we improve and increase those opportunities. Uh, the foreign minister's got a very active agenda with respect to uh, diplomacy and diplomatic relations uh, with Latin America. I've got a forward-leaning agenda with respect to opportunities around trade investment. So I think it's early days, but there's opportunities there that we can both capitalise on. Minister, just to follow up on this matter, uh, you went to Colombia to initiate uh, the free trade agreement with Colombia. Is uh, any form of no? No, so I went to Colombia to uh, explore opportunities around trade mm -hmm. uh, and investment to determine. Uh, what opportunities there may be in the future yeah. uh, and the meeting with my trade, uh, the trade minister uh, counterpart was very productive. Obviously the very big benefit that's happened in the interim now has been the peace process. Yeah. Um, the fact that that's gotten across the line I think uh, is obviously fantastic news for Colombia uh, but also means now that there's the opportunity as Colombia moves through that process to continue to focus on engagement with the world. Um, I'll be going back, uh, have an opportunity to continue our discussions, to explore further 
what we might be able to do to advance opportunities. Uh, the opening of a new post uh, there, a permanent post, will, will aid with that effort. And, uh, and I'm confident that we'll continue to see, as I said more generally across Latin America, continue to see uh, a broadening and deepening of our relationship. Uh, how do you see this relationship uh, with uh, Latin America with free trade agreements, just with countries or with blocks? We got, because we have the Mercosur, sure. the Arco del Pacifico, Same and other things. Yeah. And also there are kind of different political views in Latin America. So what, what will be the engagement, for instance, with Cuba when it opens up more, yeah. or Venezuela, which uh, there is an embassy here, but the relationship is yeah. in the same line. No? The hierarchy of preference is always multilateral, number one, mm -hmm. um, plurilateral, number two, and by plurilateral, I'd include regional blocks as part of that, and then number three are bilateral relationships. Um, in pursuing multilateral, uh, we don't do it as a government with the expense of bilateral, mm -hmm. and what I mean is that we saw the previous government adopted a, a very pro-multilateral approach, which effectively saw trade opportunities grind to a halt. Um, our approach has been different. We want to pursue multilateral opportunities, but in the absence of being able to uh, you know, obtain concrete advances on a multilateral or plurilateral front, then we've pursued you know, regional and, and uh, bilateral agreements. So in response to your question, yes, absolutely. If we can do a regional agreement, brilliant. Uh, the next step down is if that's not possible, then we look at what we can do in terms of bilateral agreements. Um, there are opportunities around Pacific Alliance, there are opportunities with respect to Mercosur. And so we've got, we've got areas that we can look at. Um, as I said, it's early days, so I, I can't really paint you a roadmap, but I can certainly highlight our preference, um, and regional is certainly above bilateral, but I will take bilateral uh, if we can get them. Um, with uh, regards to South China Sea... Uh, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll just have to go shortly. So, just because you've asked a question, is there others who haven't asked a question I can... Because I will have to... I really will have to go. Uh, I'm not okay. saying no, but just to be fair. Okay. <laughs> the gentleman behind Yeah. Uh, Australia has a very good relation with Pakistan, and uh, uh, there is a lot of opportunity in trade as well. And uh, Australia should take advantage of it. Uh, and uh, build a strong relationship in trade, especially. That's a statement question. You have a question? Yes. Yeah. So, what are we? So, I guess, what are we doing to explore that? Yeah. Uh, look, there certainly are opportunities with respect to Pakistan, and uh, and I've met um, with a number of representatives to to, to look at that. Um, I think what we've got to see is resolution, obviously, in a number of areas with respect to banking and with respect to uh, the private sector moving into those spaces. Certainly the government is keen uh, to drive a relationship that's sustainable, um, but in many respects, given finite resources at a government level, these things often need to be driven by the private sector. Maybe, uh, maybe I was going to say two or three more questions, that's it. Okay. Um, I want to ask about the TPP. Yes. Our uh, Australian government is uh, willing to accept re renegotiation of TPP if next US person wants to renegotiate the TPP. Uh, if the TPP isn't ratified by the US, then the TPP uh, is finished. Um, so uh, I think that the only opportunity lay with respect to the so-called lame duck session in the United States. Uh, if the Congress doesn't ratify uh, the TPP, then I, I think it will struggle uh, beyond that. Ultimately, we'll see who the next US president is and the approach that he or she might take with respect to uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, but I don't see anything short term. So Australia not, not going to pass away, you know, the US if the U.S. get out, Australia is not, not interested in if the China. If the United States does not ratify the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the Trans-Pacific Partnership will not get up. And you're saying that's going to happen by the end of the year, effectively, and therefore... Well, I'm being told uh, from the Americans mm. that their best chance is in the lame duck session. And yeah. In the absence of the lame duck session, once you have the inauguration of a new president, yeah. uh, both presidential contenders have indicated that they're not supportive of it. Um, obviously, it's a congressional decision, but yeah. that notwithstanding, it would be hard to envisage a situation where the Congress uh, would pass the TPP post the inauguration of a new president. Is it's possible, but 
Is unlikely. that in any way affecting the timing of the ratification here, or are you just going ahead as you would be? Anyway? No, it's the timing of Australian domestic ratification yeah. is a decision of the Joint Standing Committee on right. Treaties. And that's not being influenced at all by the American Well, you'd need to ask the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties. Yes, I'm from Vietnam News Agency. I would like to ask you about uh, so, ask me about what? Yeah. Uh, as you know, the Asian Economic com uh, Community is a form with the new beginning of this year. So, uh, it has uh, it can create a, a huge uh, opportunity uh, uh, from the market of the uh, 600 million people. Uh, so, what does uh, Australia do to uh, prom promote the uh, chase uh, um, uh, to the <coughs> in uh, general and to Vietnam in particular? Uh, so I think ASEAN is the best opportunity that exists at the moment with respect to, as I said, RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. That's the real opportunity that exists with respect to um, a trade, a regional trade block. Um, I'm really <coughs> hopeful and I'm actually quite excited about the prospects that RCEP currently have because there's a high degree of ambition on all sides, ASEAN plus uh, the, other, the other six countries that are um, having discussions around RCEP. So that's, that's promising. Um, and that remains the primary vehicle uh, to be able to exploit uh, and maximise the potential uh, for trade and investment across the region. Specifically with respect to Vietnam, we of course have um, posts there. Uh, we continue to engage. Um, at some point in the future, I hope to have the opportunity to visit. Um, but there are strong people-to-people -people links. Um, there's strong connections on a private sector level. Uh, and so we're doing what we can to reduce barriers, predominantly as it currently stands, through ANSFTA, the Australia, uh, ASEAN and New Zealand Free Trade Agreement. So there's already a framework in place, but we're going to improve on that. Please. And final question? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, from Sylvain. Sylvain, you can ask you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, you know, it's quite kind of the same, I think, they, you know, how does the US-China relations can affect trade? Uh, how can that affect trade, in, especially the South, South China Sea in the conflict? And uh, the colleague we were asking. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the uh, Australia is 60%, we understand 60% of Australia trade goes through that corridor. Sure. Uh, yeah, so how does, yeah, how does of, it yeah. affect? Uh, well, look, Australia, <clears throat> if you look at our involvement um, with Japan, with Korea, with China, with the United States. Uh, we have a very mature bilateral relationship with each. Uh, that relationship means that we are able to pursue our national interest. And indeed, China has made the point repeatedly to me uh, that China also recognises um, what a major trade corridor the South China Sea is and that they're invested in uh, not disrupting that either. So I believe that we are mature in terms of all our relationships with those, I mean, just to specify those uh, four, for example. Uh, and although there is from time to time political irritants, uh, there is also a maturity to the relationship where those political irritants are overcome. Um, we've always been transparent and consistent with our approach as a government, um, and I don't believe that uh, these matters uh, impact on our trade relationship, um, uh, and certainly haven't thus far. In fact, if you look at both volumes and values of trade uh, with, for example, China. Uh, they've continued to grow since the uh, commencement of the China-Australia Free Trade Agreement, likewise with respect to Korea under the Korea-Australia Free Trade Agreement, and likewise with respect to Japan under the Japan-Australia Economic Partnership Agreement. So, uh, so those are all big positives. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank I appreciate you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.